Today, our guests are engineers from a company, uh, U.com. Uh, it's a like, new company that uh, challenges Google and basically the product. They, they build search engine and privacy aware search engine. Sahil Jain and Sam Bean, uh, they will share you know, about their tech stack and uh, how they use Spark, Onyx and Hugging Face to run feature extraction on billions of documents. If you have questions during the talk, uh, feel free to post them on chat. And after the talk, we will have you know discussion and Q&A session and you can ask your questions directly. Yeah, thank you for inviting us. So um, without further ado, we will um, just jump right into it. So um, today we're gonna be talking about uh, running transformers at scale and is also open challenges in search. Um, so we're going to do a quick round of introductions, go through an agenda, and then we'll just get right into the content. Um, so uh, I'm Sam Bean. I'm an engineer at U.com. Uh, I focus on a number of uh, infrastructure problems uh, between our data and ML and general stack. And with me is... Uh... Hey, I'm Sahil. Um, so I'm an engineer at U.com who focuses on search and ranking systems. Great. So today we're going to be talking about uh, how we use transformers at u.com, um, how we decided to combine Hugging Face and Apache Spark for our natural language processing ETLs, um, how we kind of formulated running uh, the way we do these ETLs with massively parallel batches using the Pandas UDF, how we ended up increasing the throughput of the ETLs using the Onyx runtime, and then some of the kind of nuances of using the Onyx runtime in a Spark environment. And we're gonna, I'm gonna finish up my side of the talk uh, with an overview, some tips, tricks, and then uh, a little bit of discussion about future work. And then after that, uh, Sahel is gonna take over and talk, talk about search applications and concepts, and then kind of the future of search. So the first part of the talk is gonna be about how we do some of these things using transformers for search and um sahil is going to talk about kind of like what the future of that looks like now that we have this base set of capabilities so um first i want to introduce u.com uh, u.com is a new search engine kind of gives you control of your sources and the way that you view um information information on the internet um we kind of partition our search results into a number of what we call apps that we display to users. And we also give you the option to kind of go dark with one click with no telemetry or logging uh, via servers and therefore no tracking you on the internet. Um, but first, I kind of want to throw it over to Sahil to discuss a little bit more about how we partition our search results and kind of these this idea of an app. Yeah, so essentially we take a different approach to search where we're essentially solving various information retrieval problems in different domains corresponding to what we call apps. Um, and we power our own search across these domains, which is reflected by a diverse set of apps that span categories like programming sites to public forums. You can see apps in some of the categories listed here. And specifically within the programming category, we've built a variety of apps that power UCode, which is essentially a search engine for developers with an emphasis on programming sites like Stack Overflow. And we also have a variety of other categories and associated apps, such as shopping apps, research apps, blog and forum apps from Medium to Reddit, among others. And overall, our goal is to allow users to discover more and less time with our search. Cool. Thank you, Sahil. So quickly want to go over uh, how we use um, transformers today at u.com. Um, transformers are kind of woven uh, pretty deeply into the DNA of how we built search. Um, it's used across a variety of tasks and problems for us. So uh, using we use them for semantic search, which is approximate nearest neighbor based search via um, vectors that we embed in documents. Um, classification tasks we solve via transfer learning using transformers. We have some generative models that kind of can generate uh, code or natural language for you. Uh, based on a uh, query. And also we have some deep ranking tasks that are again, uh, learned via transfer learning uh, using transformers. So we use them pretty ubiquitously and it is hugging face um, pretty much across the board. 
So here's one example of some of our newer apps. Um, these are kind of generative apps that can take in natural language and generate here Spark code or Kubernetes commands or regexes. We also have some newer ones that can actually use Hugging Face models to generate Hugging Face code. Um, and we're also starting to look at things like uh, error correction and programming language translation, all using um, very large language models. But today we're going to be talking about um, semantic search, which is just one aspect of how we use transformers. Um, this is a pretty general diagram of, of semantic search architecture. So on the left hand side, we have a number of software systems that go out to the Internet. They, they crawl data, they persist it to a data lake, um, and then we have a variety of ETLs that enrich that data and index them into a number of downstream sources. Um, on the other side of those downstream sources, uh, i.e. databases, we have our users, which make a natural language query against our search engine. Those queries are translated to vector representations via hugging face models, and then those vectors are used to actually do approximate nearest neighbor lookups in our vector databases, which results in um, query or documents being returned back to the user. One thing to call out is this is just one way that we retrieve documents at u.com. We have a number of different mechanisms that kind of all work together to create it, the search results page that we put in front of a user. Um, and today we're going to be talking more or less all about the lower left corner of this uh, diagram, which is the ETL portion, which is how we use Apache Spark and Hugging Face together to do feature extraction across a, a very large number of documents. And so uh, quickly about some of our technology choices. Um, the reasons we chose Apache Spark are fault tolerance. Basically, um, these are really expensive jobs to run. Um, and so instead of kind of writing our own checkpointing logic to handle failures, which is kind of complicated, we end up delegating a lot of that complexity to Apache Spark. Um, it also helps improve our processing time, and it allows us to very elastically scale these natural language processing ETLs. Um, hugging face was chosen basically because it's the uh, easiest way to get into the transformers in the industry, very low barrier of entry using its APIs. It has very efficient tokenization libraries that are all written in Rust. And there's a, a really great auxiliary libraries like Optimum that can help do hardware optimizations to improve the inference time of these large models. And we're going to be talking more about the Optimum library and how we use that with some of the pipeline APIs later in the talk. So really quickly to go through uh, data processing in Spark, uh, data is basically broken down into a number of partitions by Spark using a shuffle operation. And then these partitions are operated on uh, with Spark tasks. And then those tasks, when they're completed for a partition, are checkpointed. And this is basically the atomic unit of work in Spark. And um, this enables our fault tolerance. Within partitions, the way that we process these using transformers is using what's known as a pandas UDF. So this is basically the way that Spark allows users to run their own code in massive parallel fashion. Um, the kind of legacy UDFs that were used before are actually row wise, and so they are really not effective for doing this kind of machine learning inference in, in them because Hugging Face, the APIs are built for batches. And because the old UDFs are row-wise, batches, they, this results in doing batches of one, which kind of really doesn't help with throughput. And so we use the new Pandas UDFs, which allow us uh, via the Apache Arrow system to transfer data into batches. And then we process those one batch at a time, pushing them through our transformers. Um, and so this is basically how what enables us to get a large amount of parallelism in our system, there's a number of configurable options in this that allows us to tune uh, the throughput and the parallelism. Uh, basically, the size of the partitions is a, is a very important tunable feature. Um, good rule of thumb is to try to keep the um, partition size to about 250 megabytes. Um, when you're first doing Apache Spark development, it might be very tempting to use a huge number of partitions. But this can result in the shuffle operations eating up a substantial amount of the processing time. And that means that there's less time where Spark is operating and executing user code against your data. 
There is also the max records per batch configurable option, which basically controls the size of these arrow batches that are then processed in parallel in your Pandas UDF. And for this option, you really want to maximize that uh, to the extent where your machines are completely full and saturated as far as memory and processing goes. This way that you're basically using as much parallelism as possible. And when you're doing this kind of tuning, you're going to be using what's known as the ganglia UI, which helps you kind of monitor and uh, get introspection into your Spark cluster uh, while it's running. And so kind of like a quick look at what like a healthy or an unhealthy look at a Spark cluster uh, when you're tuning these jobs looks like is, is something like this, where in the top right, you have a bunch of this purple memory, which means you're spilling uh, a lot of data to swap, which can cause fail complete like catastrophic failures of your job, which you then have to retry, which isn't great. Um, and you also see in the bottom left, you have a number of spikes in CPU. It's, it's, it's not very consistently doing its work. Um, and you can kind of compare this to something that looks a little bit healthier, where your system is kind of all fitting in memory, all your data is fitting in memory, and it's very steady. The CPU is kind of constantly just processing all of your data. Um, a large amount of the CPU in the lower left is user time, which means Spark's doing all, spending all of its time just executing user code against your data. Um, ideally, we would like CPU and memory to be completely at the top, but usually with these jobs, um, you're going to be either memory bound or CPU bound and for this job. Is, Obviously, memory bound. Hey, Sam, so just yep. Good question. I just noticed that we have some comments in the chat. So I think one of them was around: um, Can you please elaborate on the tech stack and the architecture that we were going through? So if you could maybe back up to one of the diagrams that you had before with the uh, the visuals. Um, I think Arun had a question. Yeah. Arun, uh, you uh, want to maybe ask it? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Do we want to ask questions throughout the talk, or do we want to wait until the end for Q and A? I mean, if uh, we, we can ask, but I'll, uh, it, it's better to, to continue the talk. But if there is a, like we already interrupted, it's, it's okay. Arun, if you want to ask your question now, feel free to ask it. It's basically, I see his question. Uh, uh, um, uh, queries vectors distance lookup in the pre-clustered pages. How's it been done with ultra low latency? What kind of architecture framework you use? That, that was his question. Oh, um, as far as latency goes, we can do, I think that you can do via either on a number of different technologies, you can get like sub 100 millisecond latency for these nearest neighbor lookups using a lot of the vector database technologies today. I think there's a bunch of options you can go with, be it Weaviate or Vespa or uh, Face. Um, I think there's a bunch of options to to do that and as far as more about the tech stack i mean um, we have a number of crawlers which is just python our etl is spark and hugging face um and then we use hugging face on the other side of our vector database we can't really go into exactly what we use for our database technologies does that answer your question yeah it seems so mm -hmm. okay cool thanks yep and so uh, basically when you've done all of this tuning with your uh, within Apache Spark, you basically tapped out all of the amount of parallelism you can get in your system. And if you want to kind of get further improvements of your uh, throughput in like your machine learning ETL, really the only way to do that is to either increase the number of uh, machines that are operated on your data, or you need to actually increase the throughput of your uh, user-defined functions. And so we kind of chose to do the latter because the first one means that we're spending more money. And so the way that we increase our throughput of these ETLs is via the Onyx runtime. And so um, Onyx allows us to um, increase the throughput of these neural networks. I'm going to qu very quickly go through this. Hugging Face has uh, a number of libraries that allow you to convert your PyTorch models into Onyx and then run optimizations on them, be it graph optimizations or neural network quantization. Um, and there's a problem running Onyx runtime inference sessions within the Apache Spark runtime. Basically, 
um, PySpark pickles UDF code and sends it to workers for execution. And Onyx runtime inference sessions cannot be pickled. And so there seems to be this kind of like very difficult um, uh, uh, challenge around being able to run and get the uh, the improvements in throughput from the Onyx inference uh, in uh, the Spark session. And so kind of the way we get around this is via a file broadcasting system. And what this means is that on our Spark driver nodes, we kind of pull our model from the Hugging Face Hub. We convert that model to Onyx. We run quantization or graph optimizations, which kind of the output of that is a optimized Onyx file. And then that file is then broadcasted to all of the Spark workers via the Spark Add Files API. And then in this way, each Spark worker has a copy of the Onyx file. And then that allows us to basically load the model up um, at execution time instead of having to pickle that uh, data structure and transmit it to the workers. So there's a trade-off here because obviously being able to reference a already instantiated data structure is going to be much more efficient than kind of initializing it on the fly. And so there is kind of a penalty for loading this file on your workers and then instantiating and then running inference. But we found that because of the throughput increases that we discussed earlier, we see about like a two to three X increase converting to Onyx for inference. And then we get additional increases in throughput when we do graph optimizations, quantization, kind of FP16 conversions. Um, we actually found that paying this IO penalty per UDF execution ends up being faster in the ETL setting. And so this is sort of what we do. We, we do all of our conversions opt and optimizations up front, and then we put the artifact on each of the workers. And then every time we get a new uh, pandas or an arrow batch of data, we instantiate the object and run inference then. Um, so this is kind of a quick look at what this code um, looks like for quantization. This is just like some Distilbert model. And you can see that using the optimum library makes it really easy to kind of do these uh, hardware optimizations. Um, and then again, it's very easy to broadcast the Onyx files, the artifacts that come out of the end of this using the Spark Add Files API. And then a kind of a quick look at what this UDF actually looks like. Um, you can see kind of the model is instantiated on the fly instead of referencing a model from outside of the UDF, which is what kind of triggers the pickling to happen. And then execution happens just basically converting everything to a list and then pushing that through your Onyx file. And then you get your embeddings as part of the data frame as kind of an extracted feature, which can then be used to index into downstream systems. And so this is kind of what the whole thing looks like uh, wrapped up. Um, that is basically all. So kind of as an overview. We use this combination of Hugging Face and Apache Spark. We use Hugging Face because of the very easy to use APIs and access to really great state-of-the-art models, and also some of the auxiliary libraries for optimizing, optimizing our neural networks for inference. And then we use Apache Spark for its easy to use, massively parallel processing. And we utilize the Pandas UDF to get kind of batches of data in the UDF setting. Um, there's lots of different ways to increase the parallelism of this ETL system, um, but I encourage you to kind of use Ganglia as a guiding light when you do these optimizations, or otherwise you're going to see some kind of failures that become pretty difficult to debug. And then uh, after we've maximized our parallelism in our machine learning ETL, we increase the throughput further by using the Onyx runtime. A few tips and tricks. I would start with small models. Larger models are tougher to tune. Um, there's these different partition options, the number of partitions, which impacts the size of them, and the max records per batch, which impacts the batch size of your transformer. And you, again, you want to use Ganglia to kind of as your guiding light for these. And there's lots of different Onyx optimizations to do. So I would definitely try to benchmark quantization versus graph optimizations, um, what it looks like to do FP16 versus intake conversions. All of this can have differing. Uh, impacts on your performance. And so it's easiest to just try them all. 
for the future, um, we're thinking about using TensorRT as a replacement for Onyx runtime, um, moving some of these GPUs or some, moving some of these smart clusters to be GPU clusters um, and, opti and utilizing the CUDF library, which comes out of Rapids AI, which kind of enables us to run GPU accelerated Pandas UDF. So we kind of get the best of both worlds where we can use GPU clusters um, and also kind of get to use the exact same code with the Pandas UDF. So that's all for my side of the talk. Um, Saha is going to talk about search applications and kind of the future of search. So, and then we'll do uh, a bit of Q&A. So Sahel, do you want to take it away? Yeah, thanks, Sam. And also thanks for all the great questions in the chat. Keep them, keep them coming. Um, and also we'll have plenty of time at the end so we can take questions. Um, so yeah, so basically what I'll do about now is I'll talk about the future of search and some open challenges. Before we get into this, we're just going to go quickly over some search concepts to define a common vocabulary. Um, a first concept is classical information retrieval. In classical information retrieval, we retrieve documents using traditional tools, such as an inverted index. And classical information retrieval is characterized by being generally keyword-based. Um, a lot of classical IR deals with, you know, best tokenizing queries and documents, best weighting term document pairs, querying document expansion, and learning to rank based on keyword-based scores, among other concepts. And often we leverage TFIDF scores here, which are basically making sure that if a term is querying is present in a document, and also somewhat infrequent across all documents, it'll have a high TFIDF score. Um, in practice, though, BM25 scores work better, and this is a fancier version of TFIDF scores that take into account document length. Um, so now that we've talked a little about classical IR, that said, Neural advances over the last couple of years have introduced a ton of opportunities and questions. And search pipelines often consist of retrieval and re-ranking stages. So we're going to review Neural IR in terms of its impact on both retrieval and re-ranking. Uh, when it comes to retrieval, we can use neural models to retrieve documents. Um, and this is kind of what Sam had talked about earlier. So when he backed up to that diagram where he was showing um, how we've set up our pipeline, um, a lot of this is for the retrieval stage. Um, so in order, to, so the two questions are one. Can pre-trained language models improve retrieval? And the answer is yes. We can get around some of the limitations of, um, of classical IR as keyword-based approaches fail to capture semantics. And this is in part due to kind of a lot of the advances in natural language processing over the last couple of years that I'm sure everybody's aware about. And then second, can we efficiently use such models over large corpuses? The answer is also yes. So there's been many advances in approximate nearest neighbor search at scale, which basically allow us to do low latency retrieval from dense vector representations. And there's a variety of open source initiatives, as well as companies that can abstract this infrastructure. So if you're looking to kind of incorporate this into your own stack, um, there's definitely a lot of tools here that kind of make this very doable. Um, and then in terms of re-ranking, we can likewise use neural models to re-rank documents. So this is the second stage of the retrieval re-ranking architecture. And the idea here is that assuming that we've retrieved K documents, we basically want to generate a score for each query document and then sort the documents by score. Um, of note, I'll just point out is that there's a trade-off between latency and quality. On one side, you have a lot of low latency approaches that leverage representation-based similarity methods, such as a buying coder. And the idea here is that you know you can pre-compute the embeddings for the document, you then compute the embedding for the query, and you can do some type of operation to get a score. And then you could use that score to re-rank. But then on the other side, there are higher latency, but generally higher quality approaches that basically pass all of the query and document through a transformer together. You know, this is what is known as like all tall interaction, which is expensive, but when fine tuned can be a pretty powerful signal. And then in the middle, we have some of these late interaction approaches. Um, so these are relatively newer. So this one, this term is actually introduced by Katab and Zahari at Stanford in their work on Colbert. And the idea here is that you can embed the query and you can cache embeddings for tokens from the last layer of, uh, of a document after it's been passed through a transformer. The idea here is that we can still approximate all tall interaction without passing each token in the document through every single layer of a transformer at inference time. So there was a question here around how do we do you know, things fast at inference time? It's kind of using some of these concepts um, that you know, we're talking about. And then there's also another a bunch of other approaches to represent query document similarity on this spectrum, such as you know, convolutional neural networks, but these are often less commonly used now. Uh, next slide. So now that we've kind of talked very briefly, and we can also unpack some of those terms later on if people are interested, um, I'll talk a little bit about kind of the future of searches and open challenges. So given our experiences building our own search, we've identified the following opportunities and challenges for the NLP and search community. So this is non-exhaustive, but generally rooted in the problems that we face. So I'll touch on concepts and challenges related to semantic search, combining classical and neural IR, which I just kind of introduced, uh, learning in general, benchmarking, multimodal search, and the role of generative language models. 
So kind of the first um, kind of set of challenges around semantic search. So Tam talked a lot about this earlier. And there's some questions over here. So one is around how do we embed long documents effectively? So in the chat, I noticed there was a question around, you know, how do we go about doing this? And the answer is that it's very tricky. So a lot of the existing models don't really do a good job of embedding very long documents. Um, so for example, BERT has a, you know, a token limit of 512 tokens. Um, so we have a couple options here though. So one option is that we represent the document with one vector, either by embedding the most representative text or merging vectors across chunks. So merging vectors can take the form of something like, you know, average pooling, max pooling, concatenating, et cetera. Um, but oftentimes, you know, choosing the most representative text can just be, you know, you choose kind of very important fields or you use approaches like Doctor query or summarization models to generate text. So that's option number one. And then the other option is that you can represent documents with N vectors, where N can be the number of sentences or paragraphs or some other semantic chunk in a document, for example. So option two is, of course, more expensive than option one, which brings us to our next point, which is how do we navigate the trade-off between quality and cost? Um, so there's different variables here. So one is the number of vectors. The more vectors we, kind of, we put in our index, uh, the more expensive it's going to be. Same with the size of vectors. So 768 dimensional vectors will be more expensive than quantizing and using smaller vectors. And then also a very hidden and kind of underrated but very important cost comes with the number of concurrent experiments. So a lot of times when you're testing semantic search and benchmarking, you often need to kind of do retrieval from a pretty full index. So you need to index all the documents. And this often means that you may want to host multiple versions of a semantic cluster at the same time. And these can often be kind of expensive. Um, and then, you know, once we do this keeping experimentation, there's also questions around what are the best ways to train dense plot document representations. Um, so one question is around when to fine tune. So often, you know, fine tuning is necessary in certain domains, but out of the box approaches work well in other domains. Another question is around what are the best ways to fine tune. So there are methods of basically fine tuning your querying better and then keeping the document better in static. And this can kind of reduce the amount of times you need to re-index your semantic cluster. And then there's also a bunch of thorny questions around personalization at scale without breaking the bank, and then also incorporating click signals. Um, so these are kind of just like a rough sense of how we're thinking about semantic search in the future over there. Uh, next slide. Um, so there's also kind of questions around combining lexical and semantic worlds. So in general, lexical and semantic approaches work quite well together as complements. That said, there are some challenges. So one challenge is how do we unify features from different approaches? Um, so lexical search often involves getting signals like BM25 scores, and semantic you know, search often gets signals like vector similarity scores, often the output of like a cosine similarity or a dot product operation. And we can retrieve the semantic signals for lexically retrieved documents and the lexical signals for the semantically retrieved documents in order to add some type of unification. But then we're also adding additional latency, which may or may not be worth it. So there's a question over here around, you know, what is the best way of unifying these features? Another question, a kind of like, you know, topic is around heuristic re-ranking approaches. Um, so what this basically means is, um, you know, can we blend them using heuristics? So oftentimes a simple approach might be to put the semantic results at the beginning. If you know you have a good model, a high threshold and strong filters on the semantic cluster, or you can put them at the end. If you know that the keyword hits are going to be more relevant and you need to boost recall for more semantic queries. And this is often the case in e-commerce. Um, so for example, in e-commerce, if somebody's looking for a product name it's, and, and there's a keyword hit, it's often very obvious to put that at the beginning, but then oftentimes people will kind of formulate their query in different ways, in which case semantic search can kind of help fill in the gap over there. So this is commonly the case in e-commerce, but we can mix as well heuristically, taking into account kind of more brute features like the number of words in the query, et cetera. So there's kind of a, a range of heuristic and neural approaches here. And then there's another question around in what domains do keyword-based approaches thrive? And in which domains do you semantic approaches thrive? And we do find that performance does differ across domains. Um, oftentimes, also, this has to do with user expectations. So users sometimes do expect um, results to be kind of based on their keyword hits, and they may find in, in certain scenarios. So oftentimes, it's important when using semantic search to be kind of thoughtful about it and make sure that we're appropriately using it um, so that it best advances the needs of the user. And then lastly, I think another interesting topic that's emerging in this area is kind of indexing economics. So on a per document basis, the cost can dramatically differ for both worlds, which leads to the question about which document should be indexed into a semantic cluster and which document should be indexed into an inverted index. Um, semantic search is generally more expensive than lexical search, given the large memory footprint of ANN clusters and also the high price of memory. So it's important to ask basically, what is the optimal strategy for combining both the lexical and semantic worlds from both the relevance and financial perspective? Next slide. Um, there's also a variety of challenges related to learning, which refers to learning embeddings as well as retrieval and re-ranking models. Um, one question is around learning to rank. So we've talked about kind of all sorts of signals we can get. 
and documents also have other signals like non-textual signals such as the number of likes or some notion of popularity so how do we use LTR approaches across various types of signals with low latency um, that's another question another one is around how effective can transfer learning across search domains be so there are open source models trained on billions of tennis pair examples Sam kind of touched on some of them earlier um, and transfer learning works well but when do we want to fine-tune further and also to what extent can we transfer fine-tuned models across domains such as for example a legal domain and a scientific domain and then another one is around how effective can multitask learning be in, in, in IR so there are various NLP tasks such as you know query intent detection slot filling as well as retrieval and re-ranking and to what extent can we basically share a base model or like you know learn one really good base model and share it across different types of tasks that's also kind of very nascent um, in in this community um, and I, I did see in the chat, there was also a question, right? okay, how do you actually benchmark things? So without strong benchmarks, we can't really evaluate learning, different learning approaches that we just discussed. So basically it's building strong benchmarks is very tricky, but it's critical for the development of robust search systems. Um, we obviously can't go through every document in a corpus um, for every query to find and rank the best documents. This would be very expensive from kind of like a manual perspective. So one approach involves basically manually creating truth, like round truth from automatically generated smaller candidate sets. So anytime we use kind of the word manual or humans, a lot of what we think about is how can we most effectively use humans in the loop? Um, and we basically want to, you know, do this because A, it's going to be faster and then B, um, you know, humans can be very uh, expensive as well for these types of labeling activities. Um, another approach is around weak supervision. So there's been a lot of explosion right now of, you know, weakly supervised labeling tools um, and a lot of excitement in that space. And it's kind of led to the development of and training of very large models that work really well with lots of data. So the question is, can we also use weekly supervised approach to construct train and test sets? And then a last one is that, you know, we are a consumer company and we get click signals. So we want to think about how to effectively use sparse and noisy click signals as well. Next slide. And then lastly, I'll just touch on two more. And these are more future facing, but pretty important areas where search engines will need to continuously innovate. So one topic is multimodal search. So search nowadays needs to surface well across modalities, whether it's text images or videos. And kind of there's a question around how do we search across multiple modalities at once? So embeddings in the semantic search approaches that we described earlier, in theory, can kind of play a really important role here, although we would need to effectively basically embed different modalities into the same space, the same vector space, and that can be pretty expensive. Um, so kind of thinking of cost again, how do we best use offline computation to kind of approximate some of this? Um, and then, you know, the next topic is around generative language models, and we kind of think a little bit into the future, or actually maybe even the present right now, um, as we're seeing. Um, you know, so we think a lot about what role generative models play in search. So given the exciting advances in this space, we have Uwrite, which is an app that generates text, Code Complete that basically generates code, and we also have a lot of image generation apps. Um, there's been a ton of advances in image generation with, you know, DALI, Stable Diffusion, and other generative models. Um, so kind of some questions here around how do we track provenance of generated content? So generated results often don't allow you to kind of have traceability to the source material the same way that standard web results do. And that also means, you know, how do we mix generated content? with more standard web results that users expect from search. Um, so these are just basically a couple of, you know, different questions that, and, you know, thought like the way we're thinking about different problems that I just wanted to share. So you kind of get a sense of what we're thinking about here. And the idea also is that, you know, if you're interested in chatting about any of these topics, please reach out to us at u.com. Um, and so if you go to the next slide. Ooh. Sorry, that one right before that, just the question slide. Yeah, I guess the last slide was just basically a, a, a slide with, you know, does anybody have any questions that had our emails as well? Um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll open up to questions now. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so I see a question. Uh, can you give a more concrete example of how you're using Hugging Face to vectorize documents and then match the document to a query? Yeah, sure. So yeah, that's that's a good question. So I think a concrete example might be if we look at a specific domain, and let's just use recipes, for example, you know, often people are, we have a bunch of recipe apps and people are often looking for, you know, I don't know, best banana bread or like an amazing banana bread. Um, so, and this is a very simple example. What we would do in this case is we would kind of use the pipeline that Sam talked about. We would embed um, some parts of the document and we would put that into our semantic cluster. And then we would also embed the query at inference time and find similar documents. And then we would do some type of re-ranking and some type of other, you know, post-processing logic and then show it to the user potentially. And the idea here is that we can expand the recall by taking into account semantic signals um, as well. Uh, 
if, if you guys have questions, you can unmute yourself and ask directly if you want. I, I see Neeraj earlier in the beginning of, of the talk asked, how, how large are your spark shuffles? I don't know if you, Sahil, are responding to this question in the chat. Um, can quickly respond. Um, so as far as the size of the shuffles, it depends on the size of the data that's currently going through the pipeline, but we usually have, we're usually shuffling to around tens of thousands of partitions. Um, usually it's best to try to dynamically change that depending on the size of the input data. So like sometimes we're pushing some gigabytes through and sometimes we're pushing terabytes through. And so basically dynamically changing the size of your shuffles and the number of partitions is really the only way to go to keep the throughputs uh, consistent. So I mm -hmm. guess it depends. Thanks. Uh, are you guys using Databricks? Uh, there was also a question in the chat. I don't think we can go into the specifics around like, exactly oh. what vendors we're using. Um, okay. I did see I did see one question, if you don't mind, around um, Niraj at the beginning asking if they can create an app on our mm -hmm. platform. Yeah. The answer is uh, yes, we are currently working on what's called like an open platform. And the idea is to be able to democratize the search engine so that uh, if you have search indices or you have interesting data that you've curated, you can turn that into an app using kind of our own uh, domain specific language and we will surface it on our uh, search results. So if you're looking for ways to help users try to discover your data or some product that you're working on, uh, feel free to reach out and we can definitely get you hooked up with uh, getting onboarded onto that. And you will, you won't need autocomplete. We kind of have the autocomplete baked in. And so we just need to figure out how to hook up to your data via an API or something. Yeah, sounds good. Actually, I'm not near and uh, I, will, I will I will connect you guys. Um, yeah, go ahead. Ask your question. Uh, yeah, I had an extension to that. Say I'm a small retail company. I've got my product catalog and I want to expose it to my end users. How can I use your offerings, your APIs to be able to index effectively and give them an option to ask questions in a more natural language like fashion? or even, even the regular search, is, is that something you offer? Yeah, so, right, we have like a number of uh, systems that we can kind of figure out, for example, if you have a, a, a fashion retail business and we can have, we have the natural language processing uh, capabilities to figure out like this is someone who's searching for fashion. We would then kind of just go consult your API and see if you had results specifically for what the user is looking for. Um, and then we would basically show you on the search results page. So that that's usually the way that it, it kind of works is that we integrate via an API that you might expose. Um, and then when we have users who are coming searching for something that we see as uh, an offering of your retail site, we would then show you on the search results page. But I cannot take a sliver of it and embed it into the retail site itself as a standalone. So only the products uh, or SKUs of that particular retailer is indexed um, with all its attributes and people who are searching. So it's like a very closed ecosystem at that point, but we are using basically your services to do so, like yeah. index the product catalog and then surface it based on, like imagine going to a site like Amazon, maybe not Amazon, but something smaller. And I have a need for search. Would I be able to use your offering? I would definitely reach out to us. I don't, I'm not sure if we have anyone who's actively doing that, but it's something that we're definitely thinking about. So I would definitely reach out to us to kind of talk more about it offline. Yeah. And, and I need to clarify, go okay. ahead. So. Just to clarify. So you're basically saying that you would want this to be on your own website. So okay. we kind of have different ways of doing it. So one way is you would have an app that would show up on our search engine and that you can use your own index. You can even share the data with us and we can kind of index it ourselves and potentially power it. So that would be more of kind of a, a partnership type thing. Or if you want us to kind of power your search for your website, that's also something you can reach out. We typically haven't really gone too much in that direction, but we definitely have explored it for, for other people in the past. So yeah, definitely send us an email. And are you reasonably priced? Uh, I, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Sahil and Sandra, they're in engineering team. I think this is the question for uh, people in, in BizDev or something. But uh, if you want, I will I will connect you with, with their BizDev team and uh, you can ask this question. Yeah, I think I'll reach out to Sahil and Sam directly. This is very interesting. Thank you so much for the talk. Thanks for your question. Um, I, I see, uh, G, I, I'm sorry, I don't know your your name. Uh, you, you said you, you have a question. Can you, you can ask if you want. Yes, I, I asked a question about the quality earlier and size. Thanks a lot for answering that very well. Uh, I, I was more curious about the hugging face part of it. And I was wondering, like, do you see a big leap here in the quality using, uh, using the embedding space with a hugging face instead of just like uh, using it as a directly retrieval based search engine? Sorry, um, I'm not sure I entirely understand the question. You're saying, is there a, a leap in quality between using Hugging Face models? Um, and what was the other option? Uh, versus like a regular search engine, which is just using a IR kind of thing without oh. using any kind of embedding. Yeah. When you say regular search engine, what do you mean by that? Mean... For that matter, Google or Bing for that matter, right? You guys I... are doing a lot more sophisticated thing here, right? You're using Hugging Face as the as, as a layer in between to do the semantics. Yes. Yeah, and that's that's a great question. I think your question really at the heart of it is, you know, <laughs> does it make sense to build our own search engine versus kind of use, you know, from scratch using you know, tools that are open source, et cetera, versus leveraging a lot of APIs that exist. And I think our approach is that, you know, we're really aligned with doing what's best for the user. Um, that's kind of our ultimate goal. And we do partner with other companies. So, you know, we do kind of do this where it makes sense. So if we find that, you know, using models and, and doing kind of our own search stack, which we do for 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 many apps um, helps, then we do it ourselves. But we also have open platform apps where people have their own APIs and we allow them to control the search too. Um, so we basically do kind of a mix of both. Um, that makes sense. My, my question was more like technical as in like, did you see a percentage jump in the quality or did you see like good use, like yeah. these queries that you can talk about here that you can see that oh using using a transformer that that really helped uh, help the quality here yeah yeah we we see i mean we've benchmarked approaches internally and we definitely see improvements um, by using semantic search for example and where it really helps is kind of in terms of increasing recall um, because a lot of times when you're doing and i talked a little bit about you know the inverted index um, a lot of the you know a lot of it's based on like either you have to have keyword matches or you have to have really good query expansion and you know if you're a big company like google you can have a team of people who work on query expansion, um, but you know, using a lot of the advances in NLP and, and semantic search, you can also kind of get that with some semantic approaches as well. Um, so yes, I think the answer would be yes to your question. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, I see a question from Diego. How how evaluate cloud versus colo? I think like co colocation, especially around cost. I don't know if if you guys like. Yeah, I think we can quickly discuss that so i think that cost is um not as simple as just like like the, the cost that you pay to your cloud providers i think that when we do this calculus there's so many kind of really difficult challenges in the search space that need to be tackled and a lot of brain power that's needed um a lot of what the cloud kind of gives you your pain uh, maintenance fees to them in exchange for kind of development velocity. And so I think that, yes, you are kind, you are, you're increasing your costs using cloud. I think you're also decreasing some of your, your development costs in terms of the amount of maintenance and, and setup time needed to get going. Um, if you're going like on-prem or something like that. And so, yeah, we did, we definitely, have that as an ongoing evaluation, but we still find that kind of uh, delegating a lot of the complexity of maintenance to the cloud opens us up to spending those cognitive cycles on some of the things that are kind of closer to uh, our core business problems, which are not, you know, maintaining our own server fleet. Mm -hmm. uh, question from Arun, do you pre-compute and match queries? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, so, and I assume this is talking about some level of caching. Um, so, I mean, we I can't go into too much detail around the specifics of you know whether and to the extent that we do that, but it is something that we've investigated. Um, and you know, in general, uh, search is interesting because it's like kind of in some cases the long tail. You know, there's like a lot of new searches every day, 
but there also are searches that people do on a recurring basis. Um, so it is kind of a, a technique that, you know, if you're building a search stack, I would recommend doing depending on the composition of queries and the distribution of queries that you have. If you have a lot of people doing the same query and over and over again, it makes a lot of sense to pre-compute and then do some type of caching with, you know, the best possible results. But for the search case, it's not reliable to do that for everything. So we do need to come up with ways of being able to be more robust beyond that. From the queries to the vector embeddings, there has to be a serving in place. And then I, I saw a small bird mentioned as another potential candidate to be a low latent. So how, how does that, how, how does it being implemented? Is it like a cloud function and let the cloud provider handle out of scaling or you do the, you do anything, you know, beyond that? Or do you build your own infrastructure to, for the serving? We build our own infrastructure for the serving. It's using a pretty similar set of technologies, Hugging Face, Pipelines API, um, Onyx Optimized uh, for inference, and um, like Kubernetes for the auto scaling and uh, handling the life cycle of the containers. Great, great. That really helps. And just a follow up on that. And and these searches so far we have discussed like point in point in time and uh, you know the, the could be searches that could be continuations i could search for hilton then again search for sneakers it could be sneakers designed by paris hilton so how do how do you how do you con consider those kind of cases do you stream your queries uh, do you consider any of the history at all in your during and, and how, how it is being designed in the architecture level yeah so i think that's something that we haven't started tackling yet, but it's definitely something that we're we're thinking about is per user how to maintain some sort of history and memory. But currently, we don't have like an implementation for that. All right. Yep. Thanks. And do you at any you know from a product perspective, do you uh, have the ad serving at all in your mind? Like serve some ads based on the searches. And if, if at all you have it that in the mind, how do you how do you plan on the semantic searches? People usually bid based on the keywords, not on context. So do you have have you thought in that direction as a as a company or as a product? Um, I don't think we serve we don't serve ads today. I think that I mean anyone working in like a consumer space like this is gonna at least spend some mental cycles on figuring out if there's advertising or monetization capability. Um, I think it's an interesting question between bidding on keywords versus bidding on semantic concepts and kind of the fuzzier, that being a bit of a fuzzier thing. But I don't think I have a, a great answer for you on how we would implement like ad bidding via semantic search. That's a pretty interesting uh, yeah. question. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out something on that line. Uh, how how does that work? I, I think Google is probably doing that. I, I don't know how, how they do it. Sure. Um, doing uh, that, yeah. uh, right. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks so much, Sam. Very Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Iman, you said, do you have a question? Uh, well, it's, I'm not sure if it was answered in the conversation, but if you don't mind uh, asking about this, um, are you doing enough feature extraction on the document level to enable something like a conversational AI? Is that possible? Like, uh, like I've seen a lot of the search, not exactly search engines, but more like uh, uh, kind of like AI ask a question, uh, ask a question, it answers like a scientific question or something of substance. Uh, are you doing enough feature extraction on a document level to have uh, basically that available now or in the future, or is that something not exactly the context of you.com? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Um, I guess it also depends a little bit. So when you say feature extraction at a document level for conversational AI. So basically I semantic uh, features from a document, either scientific or uh, natural language, like more understanding and processing, you know? Yeah. Sorry, I was speaking in a vague uh, way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, so the whole conversational piece is something we haven't really uh, developed yet. I think, you know, it's something that, you know, we're tracking. Um, and if there's like a, a strong user like use case for it, we'll kind of dive further into it. Um, I think there are, we do kind of generally kind of look at documents and pull out features and stuff and, and use them for retrieval and ranking. And there's a question around kind of, you know, open like QA type approaches. So if you have a document, um, whether it's like legal, scientific, um, and the query, can we pull out the specific concepts from the document at inference time? 
I think maybe that's kind of something you were, you were hinting at as well. And that's something we're probably better positioned to do. And I think that's something that's very doable, like even in the, in the next six months um, from like a technical perspective. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think uh, the conversational piece is something maybe further in the horizon, but in terms of being able to kind of extract relevant concepts from documents and surface them to the user, I think we're probably closer uh, along those lines at the moment. All right, cool, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I see questions uh, around like hiring, if you guys like hiring for like ML engineers, uh, like how our community members can submit their resumes. I think, I, th I don't know if we have any active um, positions that we're looking for in the machine learning space, but I mean, always feel free to uh, reach out. I think we're obviously very uh, trying to very aggressively expand our um, kind of our product offering and completeness of the engine. And so if we find the right people, I'm sure that we can try and find places. So, I mean, that in no way am I saying don't reach out, please, please reach out and get in contact with us if you're interested in working with us. Mm -hmm. Is it through your website or what's the best way to, to contact? Yeah, I think there's jobs.u.com. Yeah, so if you go to our website, you go to the bottom, you can see a we're hiring link and you can click mm -hmm. on that. And, um, you can also feel free to email um, any of us. Emails can... in case, yeah. Yeah, I'm throwing them in too. Cool. Also, there's a question from Arun about autocomplete. Are you doing anything special or just basic, uh, basic things? It's pretty basic. Um, I don't think we're doing anything that is really profound in that space yet. And mm -hmm. is it based on your past queries that were cached in your memory? Like if I search for, you know, for example, right now I'm, I'm just literally searching for how to make, and then you have a bunch of options. Those are just be computed set up is, is that how you or is it not like getting auto generated using some models um i think it's definitely using some models um i'm not sure how deep i can get into it okay yeah sure um yeah maybe uh, you know i could post some questions on the your slide group if you uh, sure. uh, have time maybe uh, yeah thank you so, and uh, let, let, let this be like last question because we're sort of running out of time. Are you guys uh, sort of pushing like public code on GitHub? Basically, do you have or plan to have some open source frameworks? I think that we are planning on having the ability to have pieces of the stack be open source. Um, I think the open platform is the first step towards that. We're going to start opening up pieces like the DSL and the kind of the ability to integrate directly with our search engine and offer up your own results or push data into our search engine and make it so we can index it and make it searchable. Um, and as part of that effort, kind of building the first democratized search engine, we do intend on open sourcing more. Um, we have some members who are contributors to Hugging Face. So, I mean, mm -hmm. in, in some ways, we've contributed some pieces to the Hugging Face libraries where we need them. Um but I don't think we have like a, a github.com slash u.com for, for anything public yet, but mm -hmm. stay tuned. We, come, have, come, come. Uh, yeah. we have open source, like basically our extension and, and some of the, like, you know, whether well, there's a That's VS, true. Chrome extension. So we have an open source handle, so we'll probably keep adding stuff there. But yeah, Sam is, Sam is correct about kind of the future. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh, yeah, I think it was great and <laughs> was great conversation and discussion about how search engine of the future should be. Thanks a lot, guys, for, for your time. And thanks a lot, everyone who joined this talk. It was, uh, it was great to have you here.